Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, y'all. Katie, alcoholic. Get my little world in order here. Oh, my gosh. What an honor, huh? Founders Day. Whew. Let's hear it. Come on. Bye, Gally. Don't make it that difficult for me now. I, uh, I've had the gift of sobriety since October the 28th of 1984, and for that I am truly grateful. I got, yeah. I uh, got sober when I was 26 years old. I'm 56 years old now and darn proud of it. Uh, you know, yeah, let's hear it, huh? Over, over 50. Anybody that's sitting in that wooden seat up there over 50 knows it, okay? I'm keep, keeping an eye on you guys. Yeah, that butt will get sore. That's, that's not a cuss word. Uh, I have been warned. No cussing. And... Uh, and, and I gotta tell you something, you know, I've been listening to other speakers and everybody has sent out a little cuss word here or there, but no, not me, you know. They had to listen to seven of my CDs to find one where I wasn't cussing, but, uh, <laughs> who's counting? Uh, my son did leave me a message and he said, uh, mom, hey listen, best of luck, I know this is a big honor, and don't cuss. Thank you. But I'd like to thank Jeff. Uh, you know, we met Jeff, and I, and I had no idea he was as, as involved in, in Founders Day. And, and, you know, guys, this is such a big deal. I know you know that. And if you're the worker bee in Alcoholics Anonymous, this is no jamboree. You know, this is no roundup. This is one step down from the international. And they do it every year. So, yeah, I, I'm telling you. And what I didn't know is that there's only 12 people on the committee. I, I mean, that really shocked me. And, and I, if you've ever been on a committee, you know there's some high tension on a committee. It's kind of like a group conscience meeting, you know what I mean? I mean, it can, woo! And, uh, and so I just, I'm, I, I so admire this. It was so funny. We're friends of Danny Brown's. I mean, Texas is well represented here, yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, you don't, you don't want to miss Danny. And uh, my, I was telling my girlfriend, who's not in the program, I said, yeah, we're, you know, there's like supposed to be like 10,000 people. And she goes, where are they going to put them? And I thought, I have no idea. I'm not on the committee. I just, <laughs> that's not my problem. I, this, this is my world. You know what I mean? Uh, but, oh, it's such an honor to be here. I got to tell you, and I, I just want to thank everybody who had anything to do with this. I... Uh, I've loved all the speakers. Oh my gosh, the uh, the old timers panel was fabulous, wasn't it? Oh golly, I love that. I love that. I am I am in my 30th year, you know, coming up on my 30th year, and I am an old timer, and I'm darn proud of it, you know, darn proud of it. Just gonna point out there all the times I could have cussed. Uh, and Kent this morning rocked the house. Yes. Rocked the house. Well, you know, it's interesting. Charlie and I had the, uh, the opportunity to come here, I guess it was about five years ago, and, and uh, we, we went over to Dr. Bob's house. We were doing some business in Cleveland, and we wanted to, you know, we said, hey, let's go see Dr. Bob's house. You know, we haven't ever seen it, and there was only a couple of people there, and this story is really terrible. But uh, we walk into Dr. Bob's house, and we're just in awe. You know, this is where the magic happened. And we get up to his room, and, and we, we get into his bedroom, and we see the little kid on the bed, you know, his little doctor's kid in the rug. And, and, and let me tell you, if you get my husband in a bedroom, he doesn't usually go spiritual, if you're with me on that one, you know. And, and he... And he we're standing there, and he goes, hey, honey, let's, and I looked at him, I go, we can't do it on Dr. Bob's bed. And he goes, 
I was going to say the third step prayer. <laughs> the one time I step out of spirituality and step into sexuality, I'm telling you. This being in an auditorium, a part of me wants to do the wave. So if you get that feeling and you just want to, woo, have at it. Um, and, and and I've been watching the signers. You know, we're fascinated by this. You know, we, we alcoholics are fascinated by the signers. And the word power is this, and alcoholic is this, and what is sex? Oh, she. <laughs> I thought it, I thought, I'll quit touching it. I thought it, yeah. in many ways, I thought it might be, you know, this or, I knew I was with a room full of alcoholics. I just had to wake you up. Um, and my husband is here. Charlie, stand up so everybody can see. I. Yeah, my, Charlie and I go way back. We, uh, uh, you'll hear in my story, you know, Charlie was, uh, was a huge influence in saving my life. We were both in what we call untreated alcoholism in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, uh, I, I just, I'm crazy about you. I love you. And I can't even start to talk about it. It makes me cry. But, uh, my home group is the primary purpose group, uh, in Austin, Texas. If you're ever there, we meet on Tuesday nights at Faith United Methodist Church at 7.30. We'd love to have you. We study the big book line by line, word by word, week after week, and it really is a whole lot more fun than it sounds. It's, uh, it, you know, it's interesting. We study the book uh, you know, there's so many open discussion meetings, and there's, that's fine and great and groovy. Trust me, I grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's fine. But one of the things we do a little differently at Primary Purpose Group is we study the book the way the founders felt it needed to be written. So we, we discuss why the jaywalker is there and why they put Fred's story there and why this is here and that is here and we agnostics is here. And, and we're not using our own experience. We're just kind of studying the text for the purpose of the text. And it really has, it, it just broadens my view. I'm clearly a girl who understands the big book today. That was not always my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have been on every th side of AA you could possibly be on, trust me. And I like the one I'm in today. I like understanding the book. Yeah, <laughs> I like understanding the book. I had no idea that it had every answer to every problem. Shut up. It was like, Really? I remember the first time I heard somebody reading the book after I had long-term sobriety, and I thought, are you sure that's in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? Unbelievable. But I love our home group. We have over 200 people, you know, coming every week to study the big book, which I think it means that some people are hungry for that, in that, that answer. I also have three grandchildren, and let me tell you what, grandkids are God's do-over. Are you with me on that one? Oh, my gosh. Especially for the alcoholic. My oldest grandson is seven, and he's real quick to say, Graham, can I have a popsicle before dinner? I'm like, have three, man. I don't care. It's a... <laughs> run with the scissors, baby. Run. <laughs> you can watch SpongeBob all day long. Oh, I just love it. My husband likes to t have me warn you guys. I'm a little bit like taking a drink out of a fire hose, you know. Uh, sometimes you get a little more than you're expecting, and that uh, you'll see as I lather up and wind up here. Although it's going to be hard to beat Kent. That, that was he had it go. He had it going on. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, I, I have also learned something pretty spectacular in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I am the vessel. I am a vessel to get you connected to the power. And that's all I am. I'm not the power. Matter of fact, I don't want to be the power. I never want to be the power. And when I sponsor, I am merely the vessel to get my sponsees connected to the power because I don't know what job they should have. I don't know what car they should buy. I don't know what boy they should date. But I know that I can get them connected because I know I have a message of depth and weight today. There was a time I didn't have a message of depth and weight. And let me tell you, God is so loving and kind, he takes up a tremendous amount of slack when we really don't know what we're doing. Would you agree? Oh, man. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. The book talks about... Uh, 
uh, many different ways to tell our story. And, and the one I like is on page 29, where it says where I have established a relationship with my creator. And that's what I like to talk about is how did I do this? And I, and I can tell you guys, as a kid, I was absolutely driven. From the, I was a, a, the baby of three. I was born in 1958. And I, was, I came out of the womb driven. I came out of the womb as the youngest. I felt like I was cheated in every way. And I was always looking to figure out how I could get what I needed. And that, that is in my DNA. That is to the core of my being is to be a conniver, a manipulator, and a con artist. And it's, it's there right now is what you're looking at is, is what that's about. Because today I bring this to God, and on a daily basis I try to get him and me to be on the same page. I know he wants the best for me, but it's me that stands in the way of that, not my creator. My creator is always about Katie having the best, but it's my self-will that blocks me off from the sunlight of the Spirit. And, uh, oh, I, I just, I could just go on and on with hundreds of stories. But as a kid, it was, it was when I was about eight years old, my mother got very, very sick. And when she, she ended up just basically dying overnight. She had a kidney disease. And when she died, my dad was at such a loss that he ended up remarrying three times in an 18 month period. As a, not afraid to close a deal, let me tell you. And uh, and in the process of that, we had four live-in housekeepers. So because he was a traveling salesman, he'd also played for the NFL. And and so what happened is I had seven women come through my life in an 18-month period. And today, I would have swore to God when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that that's what made me alcoholic. Because I believe something had to make you alcoholic. I had no idea that I I was just bodily and mentally different than my fellow. And so when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I really believed that if you would have been me, you would have needed a drink too. And today I understand that what that is is in the third column of a four-column inventory. That gave me all my old ideas on life. That gave me my old ideas on women, on men, on marriage, on mothers, on fathers. And let me tell you, I got a heap of them. And they come up more and more because I believe in doing continuous inventory. But I can tell you something else that I didn't get. I thought Alcoholics Anonymous was for drinking. I really did. I believed it was for drinking. I didn't get this selfishness and self-centered piece. As a matter of fact, when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a, I had a year sober. Oh, I think it's important that I tell you that my husband has five and a half months less sobriety than I do. And and one of the things in our house when he's having trouble, I always tell him, you know, honey, in about five and a half months, it'll make more sense. Just hang it. Just hang in. <laughs> but I have to tell you, in early sobriety, we grew up together, Charlie and I. And I was married. I had uh, chased a boy into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Charlie became my best friend. I mean, like my brother. There was no energy, no sexual energy, no nothing. We played like brother and sister. And he was so clearly selfish and self-centered that I could see it in him, but I was absolutely blinded to it in me. And so at some point in my sobriety, I didn't believe I had it. I was voted most likable in high school four years in a row. That's a lot of work, by the way. But I have to tell you that, that, and, and that's what I think we do in AA. I think we get an idea. We don't really ask anybody about it. We get an idea, and it's fact. It's the level of delusion that I live under. And Charlie was the kind of guy who chased the crazy girls in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know that guy. Oh, my God. We girls are looking around going, Oh, my God, she's crazy. Back it up, buddy. Back it up. And they're like this. They're just moth to the flame, man. And uh, and, and to, to me, it was just so obvious. And I had it together because drinking was my problem. And, it, and if, how, how many of you guys got sober in the 80s? Yeah, so you know what was happening in the 80s. It was... The inner child. The inner child needed to be nurtured. 
And we needed to get the chakras right and all that stuff together. And so what ended up happening to me is I just, I, I'm, I'm in early sobriety. I don't know anything. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons I always say for the newcomer, be very careful because the newcomer comes into the room and whatever's hot in your meeting, they believe is factual. They will pack that in their little toolkit and move on with it. And so I believed everybody was talking about codependency recovery therapy. So I, I got in it, and by 90 days sober, man, I'm sitting in group therapy with a bunch of drunks, and we're basically sharing our inventory. The only problem is I stayed in there for 10 years. I know, shocking, isn't it? It's made me very good at listening to inventory, but woo, did I stay too long. And that's what I thought it was all about, and I'll tell you how it flies right in the face of our book. And, and, and not that I'm against it. Don't get me wrong. As a matter of fact, you need outside help. I'm all for it. I did it. But I don't believe outside help ever gets you to that fourth column. And that fourth column is crucial. That fourth column is for me to see my wrongs and my harms to others. I never once had a counselor say to me, wow, oh, yeah. I never once had a counselor say to me, wow, Katie, you need to go back to those people and clean that up. It was more like... They're toxic. Stay away from them. And and listen to how this flies right in the face of uh, page uh, 19, top of page 20. It says, <clears throat> oh, I don't have it here. It says, if, if, for if an alcohol, it says, uh, um, the viewpoints and shortcomings of another is our guiding light. As ex-problem drinkers, our very lives depend upon the constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. I remember the first time I read that, I was like, shut up. Are you kidding me? The, uh, come on, guys. The constant thought of others, we're just all givers, aren't we? Just, I'm just a giver. I'm always thinking of others. Sure. I mean, that it, it's just not in my DNA. Now, I'll think about you as long as I can get something. But I'm always working an angle. That's what I do is work an angle. And so I thought it was all about life problems and figuring out the different things I needed to do. And then the other thing I did is I went to church. I went to church at about three years sober because I also believed that that was for me to seek. I've always been a seeker all my life. And I really felt like that that was the seeking. I'm once again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with church. Matter of fact, I say do it along with if that's your, if that's your deal. Go sit on the top of the ashram. Go do all those things if you want to, but that's along with. AA always remains my number one and everything else must fall under that. I've been on so many sides of it and it's very, very dangerous. It says on page 25 something about Roland Hazard's story that is so powerful to me because when I found church, oh my gosh, you got no idea. I found church, let me tell you. And uh, it says uh, when Roland Hazard was with uh, Carl Jung and Carl Jung was saying you need this vital spiritual experience. It says upon hearing this, our friend was somewhat relieved for he reflected that after all, he was a good church member. This hope, however, was destroyed by the doctor telling him that while his religious convictions were very good, in his case they did not spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. That's me. See, I can't go there and get fixed. I, ha I, I don't realize that these 12 steps treat my alcoholism. And what does that mean for me? Not am I, I'm bodily and mentally different from my fellows, so what are they talking about? Well, you know what? I'm an outright mental defect. I'm full flight from reality, and I can't differentiate the true from the false. I love that. I don't know about you. I love that feeling. I'm telling you, it's the best feeling in the world because when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, there was something seriously wrong with me, and I was scared to death. I had no idea that selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of my problem. Whatever. I mean, it just sounded so simple. And today what I understand is that I can get blocked off from the sunlight of the Spirit that fast. That fast, man. And once I do that, my spirit falls asleep. And I don't get that I've got to have this awakened spirit. For me, an awakened spirit personally is not much fun. To get awake means I have to swallow and digest a lot of chunks of truth about myself. 
before I can ever see anything objectionable and take it to God. Today it is so, it's just unbelievable. It's like Ebenezer Scrooge and the Grim Reaper pulling back that curtain watching Tiny Tim. That to me is what this is all about, is for me to constantly keep an eye on Katie. And the best way I do it is through sponsorship. I mean, a sponsee will come to me and be my mirror image, and there'll be my opportunity for me to see Katie in the light that I need to see it. I'm telling you guys, I was the, the, ty- the type of kid that I was, I was the... I- I started drinking at 12, and I was no different than any other alcoholic. As a matter of fact, how many remember your first drink? You know why? Because it did something for me. It did something for me. My husband likes to say something like, do you remember the first time you ever had cornbread? No, because it didn't do anything for you. But that drink did something for me. And at 15 years old, I got in a big old fight with my dad. And let me tell you what. He said, either you mind our rules or you're out. And I left home at 15 never to come back again. I got a level of pride that is abnormal. I know that about me. I'm an alcoholic. And one of the things I can tell you is this personality that I have, this way that self manifests for me, is that I'm the type of girl who you scare me, I take a step forward. And when I take a step forward, I am more of an aggressive girl than not. But if self doesn't manifest like that for you, and you're more of the stealth flyer that flies low under the radar, you can't say anything if somebody stepped on your toes, doesn't make you any less alcoholic than me. It's just the different ways self manifests, and that's the importance of that fourth and fifth step in my life, so that I can understand what is blocking me from the sunlight of the Spirit. See, I didn't get any of this stuff. I missed the whole kitten caboodle. Now, I did the steps when I first got into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, but I missed the whole piece of this selfishness and self-centeredness, and I thought that meant only when I was drinking. That's when it was really obvious. I mean, I was the kind of little girl who sat at the 7-Eleven to get the booze. You know, you were 12 years old waiting for the creepy guy to pull up. You guys know, I mean, oh, I always love the women are always like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I remember the creepy guy. You know, and you got to wait for the creepy guy to pull up, and then you got to say, hey, man, can you buy us some booze? You know, we're not the Girl Scout cookie sellers, right? We are looking for booze. And, and uh, at 12 years old on our Schwinn bikes. And the guy, the guy goes, yeah, I sure can, by golly, I sure can. And, our, and the biggest amount of trouble was to lose the creepy guy, right? That's all we, that, our job was to just go straight into the woods, you know, because creepy guy was creepy. And, and I'm here to tell you, he's sitting in the room right now, isn't he? See, we women have an innate sense. We can, we can smell you the minute you walk in the room. I could turn my back and pick him out of the crowd, you know? But it also tells you, too, guys, that, that we women, we come in here, we can handle ourselves. We can. Women have a tremendous amount of power. And most of us came in here. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> We're actually running the show, if you don't know, okay? What was it in my big fat Greek wedding is, you know, the man is the head of the household and the woman is the neck. She can get that head to turn any way she needs it to, you know. But the truth of the matter is, is in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I also believe that women have got to protect women. We need the women protecting the women. And, and here's, the, here's the real kicker. We're protecting the women from themselves, not from you boys, Okay. I remember I chased a boy into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he had six years sober, and I had ten minutes. And uh, and I am so grateful no one was the arbitrator of our sex life. But I remember him saying, this is all wrong, Katie. And I'm like, no, come to the light. Come, come. And I swear he did that. And, uh, and, and he would just tell me all the time, he goes, this is not right. I'm not supposed to be with a newcomer. Yes, you are. Shh. Sip it. And, uh, and he would read the big book. He'd sit in a chair and I'd sit at his feet and he'd read the big book. It was special. We ended up being married for 20 years. 
It was pretty unbelievable. And I am so glad nobody was the arbiter of my sex life because, you know, it's funny. We tell people don't get in a relationship for a year. That, is, that means on day 365 you are going to be very horny. Are you with me on that? And that was not a cuss word. That was not a cuss word. That is a fact all the way. And, uh, and one of the things about that is, I mean, I'm telling you what, when my sponsees get in a relationship, they may not have called me for a month. They get in a relationship, they call me three times a day. I'm telling you, at least we're getting ready to do some work. You know, whatever it takes to get you to do the work. Oh, I cheated my way through school. I'm telling you what, guys, I could, uh, today, I, one of the, the other things that I think is so important about inventory you know, inventory is knowledge. That's all it is. I mean, if you just stopped at the fifth step, all you've got is a lot of self-knowledge about yourself. Trust me, when I say inventory, I mean four through nine. I'm taking what's objectionable in six and seven, you know, the hour afterwards in five and into six and seven and making the amends in eight and nine. So don't get me wrong, but I can tell you the inventory process was so crucial to me. I had cheated my way all the way through high school, and one of the things that I found out doing the inventory process is I always thought, you know, everybody seems to go back to college when they get sober. And really, if you believe that alcoholism cheated you out of your education and that's where you need to be, rock on. But for me, that was not my experience. You see, the only reason I would have gone to college is to prove to you that I wasn't stupid. And I knew I wasn't stupid. I just don't know much. And I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know much about geography. I think they have a song like that, don't they? I don't know much about much about anything. If you really want to know the truth, and uh, and so one of the things that I can tell you that I learned was, I am a very smart, street smart gal. I'm a good businesswoman. I had an amazing career for 30 years in the fitness business. At that point, I didn't need to know what, where Venezuela was. Are you with me on that? You know what I mean? I mean, I just needed to know that that was a bicep and that was a tricep, and I was off to the races, you know? But one of the deals is we had this kid come to our uh, our home group. He was from Norway, and he was talking to me and this other little sponsee of mine. She's a, <laughs> we call each other dumb and dumber, and uh, she's just like me. And and uh, she said, is he is he from Norwegia? And I said, I said, oh, honey, he is Norwegian. There's about eight people standing around us. You know, they all just kind of dissipate. You know, whatever. And I marry into a family of educators. Oh, my God. They really, an educator thinks that they can change me. You cannot change me. Education is not my cup of tea. The fact that we're at a college and we were doing step work yesterday, we were over in one of the theaters where all the kids learn, and I was behind the podium, which is where I should be, right? You're out there as the student. I'll be the teacher. Didn't have to do the work you did to get there. It's terrible. But I, I swear, that's what I always look at. It's like, I can make it. I can make it. I know I can. And so I'm, I'm in this... Uh, family of educators, right? And they just think they can teach me about the summer solstice and the Sistine Chapel and let's go to another museum. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, to me, a museum is where you stand there and you look at something, you read a card. And the place is about this big. You go, no way, not going to do it. My husband will say, I'll ask him, I'll say, honey, how do you spell this? And he'll go, let's sound it out. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, somewhere in the sixth grade, it was like this. What are they doing, man? I got no idea. But I can tell you my qualifications as an alcoholic is when I start, I can't stop. And I can't stop starting. That's what happens to me. I'm a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. I know incomprehensible demoralization. I had a five-year-old child when I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I drugged that little girl in places she shouldn't be. I have a value system in place that tells me, stop it. For the women in Alcoholics Anonymous that raise children know exactly what I'm talking about. You look into the eyes of that child, and you know it's wrong. And you got to do it anyway. Nothing stops us. Kent's story was beautiful. He looked into his mother's eyes. 
It's the same feeling. It doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. Just more women happen to look in mother's eyes. I've always said if you boys could get pregnant, it would be really something, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. But I'm also one of the lucky ones. When I chased Joe into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had no idea what I was getting into. I had known I had a drinking problem for at least five years, maybe seven. I knew that I couldn't stop. I thought my outside issues were really my real problem. But the truth of the matter is, man, is I love alcohol. I love what it does for me. I have no idea it's calming the beast of this self-centeredness. I just love what alcohol does for me. It's an internal condition that I have. And so I chase this boy into the room of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the next thing you know, man, we're off to the races. I fall in love with you guys. I don't realize that the the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I too had an old idea that, that alcoholics were the guys under the bridge with the trench coats. I walk in and I see people like you, and I'm shocked. I am shocked at my first AA meeting. There were three people in there I drank with. That's troublesome. You know, they hung out at the same bar I hung out at. And when they disappeared, nobody asked where they were. We weren't talking about AA. You know, it was 1984. That was not a hot topic. It seems everybody knows about Alcoholics Anonymous now, but it was not a hot topic. I got so heavily involved. I was on such a pink cloud for so long. I did the steps. I made the amends that I saw were crucial from the tornado. Joe and I were all about doing all the conferences. We threw ourselves into service. We were chairing meetings. We were doing everything, sponsorship, everything. And about three years, and I tell you, I sponsor half the country, it feels like. I could almost tell you when somebody's going to start to twist off with the failure of self-will. And it happens between 18 months and three years. It happens between three and five, five and seven, seven and ten, ten and fifteen, fifteen to twenty. You'll twist off. Because that level of self-will, you can't, I don't think we can handle it. And we don't get it. I think it's the failure of, I I think my delusion tells me it's the failure of AA. I don't want to sit in another meeting and listen to Big Head Doug again. I'm not doing it. There you go. Oh, there the hand goes. I see it. You know what I mean? There's Bandana Brian. And I start picking off the only, the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, the only place that's going to save my life. And the ego and that separation tries to make me hate the only place that's going to save my life. And that's what I think ends up happening to most of us. I think, I I don't know anybody that I've ever met that said they came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and fell in love with every one of us from the minute they got there till now. I've written more inventory on AA members than I've ever written on, on my family members, you know. That's been my experience. So in about three years, I was a big seeker. I I always wanted to seek something. I never knew what it was, but I wanted to seek something. And Joe says to me, hey, let's go to church. And I remember thinking, no, you know, I was raised Catholic. You know, they were speaking a Latin. Latin. Did I get it right, honey? Okay. I usually say something else. They were speaking Latin. It made no sense to me at all. I mean, the guy is doing this number. In a foreign language. I mean, my biggest task was to flick a booger on my sister. You know what I mean? And, uh, whoo, scores, you know? And uh, so, I mean, I didn't have any pros or cons about religion. I just didn't really get much out of it. You know, I always believed there was God, but whatever. I like to do all kinds of bad stuff. And and so the other thing that was uh, really interesting is when Joe said this, he said, no, Katie, you don't understand. This church is incredible. And it was a non-denominational church. They had the screens that came down, right? And you'd sing and you'd do the worship and all this. And we come walking in. It's all the young people. And and I'm young, right? I'm only about, what, 30, 31. And we walk in and I'm like going, oh, my God. And the next thing you know, man, we are. And we are feeling the spirit. And I mean, from that point on, I turned into what I like to refer to as a Jesus freak. And I I know you know that Jesus freak. Go ahead and look at him. And I mean to tell you, I got high on Jesus. And here's the problem. Some of you may be saying, oh my God, I can't believe she's saying that. Jesus, 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 Jesus. 
Of course, I could say the Dalai Lama, and that really doesn't do a whole lot for anybody's, you know, making the hair on the back of your neck stand up. But what I can tell you is I felt like I needed to come back to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous to help you heathens find Jesus. And therein lies the problem. Oh, my gosh. And that is, that's never good. Never good. I ran every friend of mine in AA off except Charlie. And, and, and the arguments we would have is he goes, I guess I'm not living up to your Christian values. I'd go, no, you're not. And I'm telling you, Joe and I, we have a picture of us. We looked Amish. I even started wearing underwear. We, you know, we alcoholics are like Mark Houston was, was, oh, I love Mark Houston. He, he said we're like soybeans. We take on the flavor of whatever. We're the kind of personality that you need to be at the PTA. I can pull it off. I need to be at the motorcycle rally. I'm there. You know, what do you need? Whatever you need, I can be it because I blend well. Are you with me? Come on, you got to, you got, you got to realize. See, and that's the whole deal. You know, the man on page 73 is beautiful. The man on page 73 wants a reputation he knows he doesn't deserve. I get ready to walk in somewhere with this. Let the show begin. I mean, that's, that's what we do. Or you fly stealth in there. It's, it's however you show up. My life is a parade. Let me tell you, I still have so much of that got to have everybody like me thing all over me. And, and I love, I love, I love, I love the fact that we have these 12 steps that keep me unblocked. I don't even know I'm getting blocked. I don't even know it until I become very restless, irritable, and discontented. And I'll tell you, my barometer is everybody's bugging me. People standing in the Starbucks line are bugging me. People here in AA are bugging me. I walk into my family, oh my God, are they bugging me. I'm telling you, I write inventory on my husband at least once a month. He also makes my evening review about three times a week. And you know why that is? It's because of me, not him. You see, before I know it, I've married the wrong man. I can't, I cannot tolerate that breathing in and out and in. When did that start, you know? Oh my God, the way he sips his coffee, are you kidding me? The 12 and 12 says we are incapable of forming a true partnership with another human being. Can't really even dress that up nice, can you? Can't put a little lipstick on the pig there, you know. I mean, it is what it is. And so, <clears throat> if that's the truth, then I must do what the book is always telling me. I must get get through four through nine. That's the triage. I like to look at it as triage. It's just stop the bleeding. I don't care if you got 15 years sober. If you haven't written inventory in a while, you haven't really been in the step work, you've done what I did, which is called meeting-based sobriety, Five meetings a week, no step work, no pen to paper, very little prayer and meditation, no evening review. I didn't do an evening review for 17 years. I didn't even know there was an evening review, you know. And so I, if you're not doing any of this stuff, we got to get you through the triage, man. we got to get you through the process to where you can begin the disciplines of 10 and 11. There's people sitting in these rooms that have been doing it all along. I didn't do it. It was not my experience. Joe and I got heavily involved in this church, and we ended up staying there for three years. Now I'm six years sober. He's 12 years sober. And all of a sudden, we're both dying on the vine. And he said, what are we going to do, honey? And I said, I don't know. He goes, let's go back to AA. I said, I'm in. We go back into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, same noon meeting that we used to go to. We look around, and I leaned over to him, and I said, oh, my God, honey, we're home. We're with our people. See, this will always be my people. I will always feel really connected with the room. Oh, I'm telling you. I, I love you drunk or sober, too. I love drunks if they're drunk or sober. Now, I can only tolerate you so long if you're drinking. But 
I do, I do love you drunk and sober. And so the next thing I know, I'd love to say we skipped down the yellow brick road from that point on. Oh, my God, it would be wonderful to say that. But what we did is we joined what I call meeting-based sobriety. I did not get that we needed to work the steps anymore. I, nobody said that to me. I just didn't get it. So what I was getting out of the meetings, because we were doing about five meetings a week, was relief but not the freedom. See, the relief is what we get when we get to the meeting. But I wasn't getting connected to the power. And so when I'd go to a meeting, I would hope you'd say what I need to hear. Because, man, I'm wound tight. And about two hours after that meeting, boy, I needed another meeting. And that's what it was. And that's what that looks like. I, I was a big slogan slinger. And if I had a problem and I came to you and you slung a slogan at me, let it go. Love and tolerance is our code. Especially if I'm talking trash about somebody. Anybody relate to that? Thank you for the hand over there. Yeah, there's one other person gossips in this room. And... uh and, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm over there gossiping and somebody says, Katie, love and tolerance is our code. I wanted to slap their lips off their face. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you, you're coming at my ego. You know, at that point, what I wished I'd have heard is let's go outside and talk about this. Let's take this through the, a four column inventory. Let's look at doing a little inventory on this so you can see it from an entirely different angle. But instead, what you're saying is, let's work the promises, hope the steps come true. And that, to me, is not the way the book lays it out. The book has very clear-cut directions into what I'm supposed to do. If I'm sitting in a meeting today and I see somebody raise their hand and they are really angry, I'll go over there and say, hey, listen, you got a few minutes, let's go outside. Let's sit down, let's talk about that situation. And if you do it correctly, you can work all the way around that ego, man. And you can get them to look at it from an entirely different angle. You can have them tell you what's wrong in column two. You can tell them what it's affecting in column three and what's going on in column four. And they don't even know what hit them. But they begin to feel that relief. And that relief is... Anyone that's sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that is in pain can hear solution. They just don't necessarily know how to get there. And that is what my job is. One drunk sitting knee to knee with another drunk. That is my job. I know it today, and I didn't know it then. And there was also a time I did not have the solution. But I believe God takes up a tremendous amount of slack. I think physical sobriety has a tendency to look like recovery, and I was living in it. I love what it says on page 25. It says, if you are a serious alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle-of-the-road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out of the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could. And the other was to accept spiritual help. I guarantee there are people in this room blotting out their intolerable situation right now and scared to death to say anything about it and have no idea where to go. Well, I'm here to tell you there's a place you can go, and I'd be happy to be the one to help you with it. I can hook you up with people that can take you through this book and get you to the freedom. I'm telling you, and that's where I'd like to hear the applause. Absolutely. I'll just start asking for my own applause, you know what I mean? But but that's what I'm saying, guys. I Wait till you hear the rest of this story. It rolls out terribly. I thought we had the answer. I thought Joe and I had found what we needed, and that was to come back to meetings. Don't get me wrong. Meetings are a part of our triangle. Meetings and service, unity and service. But recovery is our foundation. The 12 steps are our foundation. And so we're trying to live off one side of the triangle. And that we're trying to live off that fellowship-based sobriety. And so Joe and I are tooling along, and then all of a sudden my husband gets sick. And I'm talking very, very sick. And there is something wrong with him, and we don't know what it is, but it's in his head. And so he goes to all these psychiatrists, and we can't figure out what's going on. And all of a sudden, we, we, this, uh, one of my girlfriends at the meeting says, Katie, if the doctor says he needs to go have his head scanned, you need to have good medical insurance. All we had was catastrophic. And she said, if you go drive a school bus, you will get instant HMO. And I'm like, really? Now, see, I've already begun living in the victim of the delusion. 
that I can rest satisfaction and happiness if I just manage well. I get that. And I'm out there managing my tail off, and I'm in constant collision with somebody or something, even though my motives are good. And so I ended up going down to this bus yard, and I get the job because I can get it. I, I have a level of self-reliance, guys, that if you want me to set down that tool, you're out of your mind. See, I left home at 15. I got through high school. I've been an amazing career in the fitness industry. I am not about to set down self-reliance. It gets me what I think I need. Don't get me wrong. I'll bring God in when I need him. I just haven't really needed him. You know what I mean? Take a knee. I got this one. And so what ended up happening is I go down, I get this bus job, and the next thing I know, we're in the emergency room to get my husband's head scanned. And the doc comes in, and he puts his hand right here on my shoulder, and he says, my God, he's got a gigantic tumor in his head. And I remember my very first thought was, my God, I'm going to be driving this bus for the rest of my life. See, that's the level of self-centeredness I have. And that's the level of self-centeredness we have. Nobody's going to know that first thought. Oh, my gosh, that certainly doesn't make me look very good. But I didn't look at Joe and go, well, that's just great. I'm going to be driving that stupid bus now while you got a brain tumor. That was not what I did. Matter of fact, we cried and cried and cried. And at that point, the, the doc told me, he said, He will never work another day in his life. Now, we were a two-income family. We had a kid in college and one in elementary school. And for when you tell me, when you threaten my money, watch me go crazy. And so he said he will work, never work another day in his life. Now, remember, I'm uneducated. All I have is the fitness business. Oh, I'm getting older, and my body cannot handle much more. And I ended up, it felt like I swallowed a tennis ball. And one of my dear friends was sitting there, and he goes, Katie, what are you going to do? And I was like, I can't even talk right now because there was no God. Are you kidding me? I'm an untreated alcoholism. I am an alcoholic, a garden variety drunk. You scare me that bad, get out of my way. I got this. When you talked about your mother putting that family on her shoulders, I can put a family on my shoulders and get out of my way or I'll run over you. That's what I do. And let me tell you what, guys. I almost killed myself and my family in the process. I went out there and I produced so much money because I can make money. I produced so much money and in the process, I wasn't listening to anybody. I just pushed you out of my way. And if you would have come to me and told me that was untreated alcoholism, I would have said, look at my situation. I got big problems. Don't throw your little spiritual toolkit at me. I can handle this. And that's what happened in my life. And I'm telling you what, I ended up driving that school bus for three years at that point. And I got some bus stories that make you wet your pants. Go ahead and picture me behind the wheel of a bus. Yeah. Oh, I'm blending. I'm blending real well. I got, I got this guy in a BMW that will never forget me. I can tell you that. I lived, it was a fairly affluent neighborhood, and this guy in this BMW, you know how it is when you see a school bus, you always try to beat him. Well, stop it. It's a god dang school bus, you know, full of children, and the bus driver's losing her mind, and and this guy would see me, and he would see where the stop is, so he'd gas it to try to pass me, and he'd be flying past those children's bus stop. So he pissed me off so bad that there is so much power in that stop sign. I'm, I would just kick that door open. There was no bus stop there or anything. And he would just, Eek! and I swear, I'd look at him and go, who's got the power now, buddy? Uh, and I swear, he'd always look at me and go, what is your problem? I'm like, you. Or my problem. But, you know, he wouldn't pass that stop sign. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Now, now keep in mind, I'm in untreated alcoholism. I'm not running that past anybody. I'm doing what I got to do to get by. One time, the kids, it was, it was uh, fabulous. I got all these little boys were on the end of my stop. And it was, the, you know, they're, they're like the last five kids in the bus. And, 
And they'd say, Miss Kate, take us down the hill. And there was these two humps, right? And then you had to come to a stop. And I drove a gas bus because it was fast. I didn't want a governor on my bus. I mean, I hauled ass. You know what I mean? I had, st- I had places to go. And this bus job was strictly for the insurance. One day my bus check was 32 cents. Okay, so it was strictly for the insurance. And it was doggone good deal, let me tell you. But so you'd go down these two humps. And I would, I'd tell these kids, I can't do it, man. You guys, I'm going to get in trouble if I do it. No, come on, come on, Miss Kate, come on, come on. Okay, fine. Everybody to the back of the bus. They don't, they all get to the back of the bus. And it was all boys, just in case anybody's panicking. And, uh, and you can, you can throw boys out the window and they're fine. You know what I mean? And I, I would go, okay, get ready. And I'd gas it, man. And we went over those two humps and I got so airborne. It was unbelievable. And you look up in the mirror and they'd be like, ah! Oh my God! And and I could get them. I could shoot them five seats, man. You know, I mean, uh, and all of a sudden, you you got to hit the brakes because the street stopped and you had to take a right. So I hit those brakes, and all of a sudden the bus just goes. And I swear those kids are like this. And I go, what was that? We all get off. I blew all four valve stems off the back end of that bus. Oh, yes, I did. And those kids were like rats from a sinking ship, man. They, pew! Oh, you know, I got to get on the phone, you know, the the, the radio. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, turtle bus to base. Turtle bus to base. Base comes on. You know, our boss has a little walkie-talkie on his hip, and. And uh, the guy, the maintenance guy goes, yeah, turtle bus, what's up? I said, man, uh, Billy, I don't know what happened, but uh, all four valve stems just shot right off the back end of my bus. And you hear the boss go, what? So I'm not going anywhere, man. I'm dead in the water. And so I got to wait for the maintenance guy and the boss to come. And this is how that moment took place. They looked at the bus wheels, they looked up the hill, and they looked at me and said, you don't know what happened? I said, no, sir, I do not. (laughs) I'm 15 years sober, and I can lie like that, because I can't lose that job. That job is everything I got, and I will lie to you if you scare me bad enough, right out of my mouth. And what ended up happening, you know, is Joe, uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the safety net. You know, on page 14, it says, For if an alcoholic fails to enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he cannot handle certain trials and low spots. And I don't think trials and low spots have to be a traumatic brain tumor. I think they can be something as simple as losing your job. I really do. Heck, it could be just an over overdraft fee. You know, if you're at the breaking point, you're at the breaking point. And Joe ended up relapsing with 23, excuse me, with 23 years sober and died of a heroin overdose. So I have a, I have a situation now to where I'm going, are you kidding me? I mean, dies of a heroin overdose at 23 years sober? See, I didn't realize that we were in what I call untreated alcoholism. We did not have a safety net. Our grace ran out. And that's what's so difficult, is this grace period is really a time clock if we're not paying attention to the fact that we suffer from alcoholism. And I, like I said, I, you almost lost me. Thank God Charlie drugged me around. It was interesting. He was in untreated alcoholism. I was in untreated alcoholism. And I really believe God takes up tremendous slack when we're in untreated alcoholism. I think he takes up tremendous slack, period. But, oh, yeah. And, and thank God. The beauty of that grace is what saved my life. And he had heard of a guy named Mark Houston. And Mark Houston changed our lives. How in the world I could sit and listen to Mark Houston and he could get past this ego? Because I think the more time we have, the less you can tell somebody with time. Because I have been sober for 15 years. What can you tell me that I don't already know? And I think it's a very, very dangerous place. I began to understand this second surrender. I got a sponsor that was in untreated alcoholism herself. And I'm telling you, here's the beauty of how God works. 
He took her and through me made her dig deeper and deeper into the book and saved her life while saving my life. Who would have figured that one? And, and I'll never forget, it's about 18 months after Joe's died. I am losing my mind. I am in these bedevilments like nobody's business. Let me read these bedevilments. They were read earlier today, but they're worth reading a lot. Page 52, we were having trouble with our personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature. We were prey to misery and depression. That's really self-pity. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. Today the term is anxiety. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. I had had three blow-in-the-bag anxiety attacks in sobriety. I'd never had an anxiety attack in my life. You were talking about them. Unbelievable. Nobody was more scared than me. And you're going to tell me that that's alcoholism? Move out of the way. I had no idea. And I really believe what ends up happening is when we're sitting in this dangerous place, we could do something as simple as getting a root canal. We go in. We got the the malady is all over us. We don't know it. We're going to meetings. We hadn't touched a staff in years. And all of a sudden, the doctor says, you need some Vicodin. And I say, you know what? I sure do. And the next thing you know, man, I'm off to the races. I'm rescheduling more dental work because that's what we do. We lose more people behind pills today than anything. And I think it's, yeah, oh, trust me, it's, it's heartbreaking. And I also believe this because I've seen people doing this. I was in a place that was so bad at 18 months. It was so dark in my life. My son had already lost his father. My bedroom was so dark. I couldn't get out of bed. I mean, I was in the worst place I'd ever been. And he'd open the door and I would scream, shut the door. Leave me alone. I had no idea I was scaring that boy to death. He'd already lost mom. He's getting ready. I mean, dad, he's already getting ready to lose mom. And I'm, I'm 15 years sober, guys. I'm supposed to be the one holding it together. I'm supposed to be the spiritual one. There was no spirituality in my life at all. And I called this sponsor of mine. She's brand new with me, you know. And I said, uh, Marty, you're not going to believe this. You know, I am just really struggling here, yada, yada, yada. And she says, Katie, do me a favor. I want you to read pages 60 to 63 in your big book. And I tell you, I didn't even know where my book was. That's never good. Just take a moment to think if you know where your book is. Just just saying. And uh, I opened that book to page 62. And it said, selfishness and self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our trouble. Well, I'm the kind of girl who picks that phone back up and calls her and goes, what are you talking about? You just told me to read the book. I was looking for the part that said some of us have it harder than others. And she said, oh, honey, there's a fine line between sorrow and self-pity. And I believe you stepped into it. And for some reason, I was able to hear it, guys. I'm telling you what, when she started explaining that third step to me, see, I'm a self-seeker even when trying to be kind. I'm a producer of confusion rather than harmony. Where did I set the ball rolling? It never occurred to me. I really thought life was coming at me. It was coming from me. It is in my DNA to be this self-centered. Without these steps on a daily basis, Mark used to say, turn back to the line, awake and aware, awake and aware. My spirit falls asleep so quickly that I don't even know I'm asleep. I'm asleep dreaming I'm awake. And I get back in that constant collision without ever knowing it. I'll tell you, I got a few more minutes left, and I got to tell you a couple of things that I've noticed, and and it's it's from my own experience. I was with Charlie's family at Christmas time, and and uh, you know how family is. Yes, and family can be challenging when you're around them during the holidays, and and uh, and I found a, a game called Candy Crusher. Oh, my God. And I'm not a big gamer, okay? I'm not a Facebooker. I'm not a gamer. I don't pick my phone up every two seconds. And I found myself involved in this candy crusher on a level that I could not believe it. It's the type of game you can pick up for every 15 seconds. You know what I mean? Play it and set it down. And at that point, one of the things the book is talking about is peace of mind. 
that I could be in the moment where God is. And I found myself picking that game up every chance I got. And I heard the still, quiet voice say, you're in trouble. And let me tell you something, I was so grateful that I heard that still, quiet voice. I was doing Candy Crusher for three days. And to set it down, it took me a month to get over it. A month where I wanted to pick it up. I'd sit next to somebody on the airplane that have it, and I'd have to look up, oh, no, 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 no. I recoil from that as if it were a hot flame, man. Because I am always looking for something to take me away. Always, always, always. Money, sex, kids, work, anything that will take me out of this present moment. I believe that God is constantly trying to wake us up. Constantly. It's, it's, it implies in our book that we're going to fall asleep a lot. I mean, all the warnings in the book say you're going to fall asleep a lot. And if that is the case, then my task here is to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comforted, right? It's to wake us up. Yeah, it's... We suffer from a fatal illness, right? I mean, sometimes I forget it's fatal, and I think it's just problematic. But it's a fatal illness. And I'll tell you guys, if, if, if anything I've said, I, I'm here for middle management. If anything I've said, my experience has awakened anybody's spirit. There is help out there. A moment of clarity is of no value if it's not followed by action. If you're not in the book, please get in the book. And if you are... I'll see you on the firing lines. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.